Good evening, everybody, and thank you all for joining us for tonight's With Insight program, um, Unsung Research Heroes. Uh, my name is Jackie Lees, and I'm Associate Director of MIT's Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. And I'm really delighted to be moderating this program and showcasing some of our researchers who often behind the scenes make critical contributions to work at MIT um, and the KI. And in particular, tonight's program highlights the staff of the Koch Institute's Robert A. Swanson Biotechnology Center, for which I serve as faculty director. So before I begin, I want to tell you very briefly about the Swanson Biotechnology Center, which is named for Bob Swanson. Um, and let me start my slides. Um, so, uh, here we go. Um, so um, Bob is the gentleman um, shown here. Um, and uh, he was a member of MIT's class of 1969, an alumnus of course five and course 15. So for those of you who are not an MIT aficionados, that's chemistry and management. And he was also a proud member of MIT's Sigma Chi uh, chapter. Um, and those are the folks he's pictured with here. So Bob recognized uh, the therapeutic potential of recombinant DNA, um, which was an emerging technology at the time. And in 1976, he sought out and partnered with a professor at UCSF, Herb Boyer, and he's shown on the left here, um, and they founded Genentech. So Genentech is widely considered to be the beginning of the biotechnology industry as we know it, and it continues to be a leader in this field today. So very sadly, Bob passed away from glioblastoma, an aggressive brain tumor at the age of 52. He was posthumously awarded the National Medal of Technology and Innovation for his foresight and leadership in recognizing the promise of recombinant DNA technology and for his seminal role in establishing and developing the biotechnology industry. The Swanson Biotechnology Center, or CBC as we often call it, was established in conjunction with the creation of the Koch Institute. And it's really been part of our DNA since we formally opened in 2011. The SPC was created through the generosity of Bob's family, friends, and his Sigma Chi brothers to continue his legacy at MIT. And I know that several of you are in the audience tonight, so I'd like to say a special welcome to you and thank you for all of your efforts. Beyond the cancer connection, the work in the Koch Institute aligns with Bob Swanson's legacy in several ways. First, there's Bob's innovation and collaborative approach, and that was critical for the foundation of Genentech and also for Koch Institute's research model. And most relevant for tonight's program is focus on advancing science and technology by connecting and nurturing people in a way that helped them do their best work. So having introduced you to Bob, um, I'd like now to tell you more about the SPC itself. So at the most fundamental level, the SPC is home to the Koch Institute's core facilities. And for those of you who are not familiar with what a core facility is, these are basically shared community resources. They have dedicated space, equipment, and most importantly, staff, and collectively provide access to essential capabilities, including technical services, high-end instrumentation, and most importantly, expert guidance and training. So what are our core facilities? Oh, sorry, and this is the Koch Institute building today. So, so what are our core facilities? Um, I'm not gonna read you the whole list, um, but we have more than a dozen cores, and most of which are clustered together on the main and garden levels of the Koch Institute. And very importantly, they're open not only to Koch Institute members, but to all of MIT. And in many cases, they also service users from other academic institutes, uh, both within the local area and beyond, and also industry. And this interest in using our cause is really a testament um, to their quality and impact on research. So I've already mentioned how the cause uh, produce technical capabilities, um, and I thought it might be helpful to give you a couple of examples. So the diagram in yellow is a robotic system that allows our high throughput sciences core to conduct high capacity multiplexing drug screening, as well as many other applications at a level that's unusual um, for academic centers. Um, the diagram in the top corner is basically a key component of a suite of imaging capabilities developed within the nanocore 
that amongst other things enable generation of ultra high resolution structures of cells in 3D, allowing us to pinpoint the location of, of proteins or nanoparticles generated by our engineers. And importantly, the nanocore is one of only a handful of labs in the world with this full suite of imaging capabilities. Now, importantly, our cores also provide feedback, um, not only with uh, the cores providing services to us, but also working with our researchers so that technologies developed within KI labs can actually be incorporated into the SBC, making them broadly available to the community. And I just wanna show you two examples. So the diagram at the bottom um, is a device called a NanoWell or SeqWell. And it actually contains many very small uh, pockets and it's actually a method that you can isolate single cells and then examine um, their DNA and their gene expression level on a per cell basis. And the final diagram is a zebrafish model that was incorporated by and developed by one of the labs in the KI. And that actually lets you watch the interaction between metastatic cancer cells, which are labeled in green, moving in and out of blood vessels labeled in red um, in real time with the support of services from the microscopy core. Now, very importantly, over the course of a project in, or even an experiment, a researcher often utilizes anywhere between four and six cores in the SPC. And the close proximity of their cores and the way they work together has really ensured that it allows a smooth uh, progression of the project and enables this interplay. Now, while the SPC is home to very advanced leading edge technologies, these tools would essentially be useless without our amazing SPC staff. And those are the folks who are really here to highlight today. So this just shows you um, a, a number of our staff members. Um, and they're all, in fact, all of our staff members are highly trained scientists and engineers. Many of them created graduate and postdoctoral training um, and even ran their own labs. And they've worked in academia or industry or clinical settings um, and often a combination of the two. And many of these individuals really um, had very much the capabilities of founding their own labs, but instead they wanted to stay hands-on with the research and they've chosen this as a career route um, to enable interaction um, with researchers. Every one of them are experts in their particular field or technologies, and many are one of a handful of people in the country with their specific skill sets. And in fact, recruiting these individuals can be highly competitive and we're really fortunate that we're able to work with them. At the Koch Institute, we re regularly pursue projects and collaborations that are cross-disciplinary cross boundaries. And that actually means that many of our researchers are often working well outside their expertise and comfort zone. And the SPC staff members turn out to be full partners in our research and often our teachers as well. And they really serve as the glue that brings the project together. They typically participate in many of the stages of the project um, starting out being involved in the design and then the execution and analysis of experiments. And in many cases, they adapt or even develop technologies that are tailored specifically to the project or project goals to ensure that everything we do is really at the frontier of the field. Our SP staff also play critical roles in educating our researchers. This includes developing courses, um, and classes, and they also uh, do hands-on training that allow the researchers themselves to learn how to use our high-end high -end instrumentation. And this is something that's really critical for their career progression as they transfer into other institutions that may help them to buy the instrumentation, but don't have the staff and capabilities to run them for them. Okay, so, what I've told you about is equipment um, and people. Um, does, how does all this come together? Um, and what I wanna tell you is that in fact, this a collection of people and technologies is such that the whole is so much greater than the sum of the parts. And that is the essential heart of the SBC. And very similar to the roles played by Bob Swanson himself, the SBC serves as a connector and a research accelerator for labs at the Coke, um, around MIT and the um, research environment for beyond. So I myself have been at MIT for more than 25 years. And I remember in the old days um, when we wanted to do an experiment, we'd have to search out a piece of equipment in someone else's lab or try and raise the money to buy it ourselves. 
only to discover the huge learning curve in using it, designing experiment protocols, and I think hardest of all, um, uh, finding the wherewithal to keep it up to date. With the SPC, all of this knowledge and technology, including methods and technology that we ourselves are developing at MIT, resides in one central hub and is accessible to everybody, providing support at every stage of the project. So very essentially, the SPC lowers critically the financial and technical hurdles to do science and democratizes access. And ultimately, this makes our research go faster, which particularly in the case of cancer research is really important. So without further ado, I want to turn things over to the stars of tonight's program, our research teams, um, who can give you a first-hand uh, description or examples of the research projects where SPC staff members are playing key roles. As a reminder, after the presentations, we're gonna do a panel discussion and we'll be happy to take audience questions then. So feel free to put your questions in the question and answer section at the bottom of the Zoom window at any time. So with that said, I'd like to introduce the first team who's from the Integrated Genomics and Bioinformatics Facility. Um, so please uh, take it away. So um, good afternoon, my name is Sandra Martz. I am a research scientist in Sanguitas Batia Laboratory. Together with Niketa Nerurkar and Charlie, we have been working on how biological clocks influence liver functions. So today we are delighted to share part of this story with you. Thanks, Sandra. Um, my name is Charlie Whitaker. Um, I got, got my uh, PhD from the University of Virginia uh, in cell biology and then moved to MIT to join the lab of Richard Hines for my postdoc. Uh, during the course of that work, I became interested in bioinformatics and um, ended up spending a little bit of time at the Broad Institute working on part of the Human Genome Project and then returned to the KI as the first member of the Barbara K. Ostrom uh, Bioinformatics and Computing Core Facility inside the Swanson Biotechnology Center. Um, Nikita is going to introduce the, our biology of our, our project a little bit. Great. Thanks, Charlie. So circadian rhythm is a 24-hour cycle that is largely controlled by the solar day and night light and dark cycle that we see every day. Circadian rhythm, especially in the human body, is controlled by the brain, which in turn controls two major body cycles, sleep and wake, and feeding and fasting. Unfortunately, when we don't see this circadian rhythm in the body, when it's disrupted or disturbed, we see a whole host of diseases such as cancer, metabolic disorders, depression, diabetes, and so on. Although the brain largely controls circadian rhythm, all our surrounding cells, tissues, and organs also have their own circadian rhythm. And one of these organs is the liver. The liver in itself, although the Bhatia lab has extensive expertise in it, it's also an incredibly interesting organ because it has this range of functions, some of which are metabolism of carbohydrates and amino acids, or synthesis of bile acids and plasma protein. But the most interesting one for us today that we'll be focusing on is the, this unique function of the liver where it's able to metabolize and detoxify drug. So given all these varied functions of the liver, it's really important that we're able to find a system that can very closely mimic the human liver. And as a result, the body lab has engineered this micro liver system where we're able to pattern human uh, hepatocytes or, or liver cells and create a micro liver system which is able to mimic the functions of the human liver. And so we use these micro livers and we set them all in the same clock or circadian rhythm and are able to then perform our experiments. Thanks, Nikita. Uh, yeah, so once uh, Sandra and Nikita get the, these micro livers synchronized, what they ended up uh, doing was collecting uh, biological samples in triplicate um, over 48 hours at three hour in, inter intervals, so a total of six, uh, 16 samples. 
once uh, 16 different time points. And once they had all these collected, they prepared RNA from these samples and then transferred them over to Stuart Levine, our colleague in the genomic side of our core, um, where uh, Stuart plugged those uh, uh, samples into his RNA-seq pipeline and generated a, a gigantic amount of sequence data. For this particular experiment alone, it was almost a terabyte. Um, Date, raw data at this level is a little bit inaccessible to bench scientists. And so one of the critical um, activities of our core is to remove that barrier between that uh, largely incomprehensible raw data and usable results. And, and the way that we go about doing this is first taking advantage of um, the outstanding computational resources that we have in the Swanson Biotech Center uh, to process uh, that data into a more usable form. But in addition to that processing, we also are charged with safeguarding the data. When you spend this much time and effort and money uh, generating results like this, it's critical that you, you have it saved in a way that's not gonna be lost to some computational glitch. So we go to great lengths to make sure the data are safe and secure. Um, in this particular experiment, the, some aspects of the processing were routine for me, but others were not. I had not had a chance to work on circadian rhythms before. So I needed to research the different algorithms that were available to identify cycling genes in situations like this and then deploy them on this data set. Uh, after doing that, um, I assisted uh, Sandra and Nikita with uh, a visualization and interpretation of the results. An example of visualization is shown here in this heat map. Um, each column of this heat map corresponds to one of those 16 time points every three hours for 48 hours. Each row in the heat map is, corresponds to a gene. There are about 50 being shown in this picture. And then each cell uh, is, is reporting the gene expression level for that particular gene at that particular time point. Yellow color indicates a relatively high level of expression, while blue indicates a relatively low level of expression. And so in this, uh, when the visualization is set up in this way, you can see genes go um, higher level and then lower level and then higher level and then lower level. So this oscillation or cycling over time. Yeah, and depending on the statistical thresholds that we use to identify the genes, we end up somewhere between 50 and 400 genes that display this pattern. Um, the next question that we had is how, what are these do genes doing? What are their functions in the liver? And so we did an additional analysis looking for enrichment of these genes in known functional pathways or collections. Um, and the top, top five from one of these runs is shown here. I wanna call your attention to number three, which is drug metabolism. Um, this particular functional category contains a lot of genes called CYP genes. Um, Nikita was able to take this information and go back to the microlivers in the lab and look at one of these uh, CYP genes uh, specifically, but not at its gene expression, instead at its actual uh, protein function, so its enzymatic activity within those microlivers. And she was able to observe that same down, up, down kind of oscillation at the protein level. And this provided a very nice, uh, reassuring, and uh, uh, um, uh, a powerful kind of verification of our workflow. Um, so Nikita? So the experiment that Charlie just showed that Sandra and I just that Sandra and I did becomes exciting in an example over here on the left. So for example, if you have if you take a drug and the parent drug it itself without being, you know, converted into anything is your active and therapeutic form, you want to make sure that nothing from that or minimally it is getting converted. So what you want there is your enzyme activity, your converting metabolizing enzyme, you want the activity to be really low. Conversely, if you have a drug and, and it only get, becomes active and therapeutic when it's converted into its products, you really want to dose that at a time where the enzyme that's, that's converting it is having really high activity. Um, and so, so based on this idea, we looked at this enzyme CYP3A4, which, which in turn metabolizes many, many, nearly 60% of drugs, and looked at a list of these drugs in the next panel here. Um, and what you can see is what we divided it based on drug class. And the second highest uh, number of genes in the drug class are in fact anti-cancer drugs. We then also took this list and uh, divided it based on whether they're involved in acute or chronic treatment. And this becomes uh, relevant in an example such as if I have a headache, I would need to take that medication immediately. I won't really want to wait until say 4 p.m 
where it's ideal to take that medication. However, in a more chronic setting, such as in cancer therapeutics, where you're taking the drug uh, multiple times over months or, or longer, uh, almost every day, that timing of when you dose can become more and more relevant. And what we see here is that the, the goal here is that if you're able to do this, you can hopefully increase the efficacy of the drug, decrease toxicity, and eventually decrease the dosage. So together, Charlie, Sandra, and I, uh, along with the SBC, are really hoping to work towards this idea of personalized medicine. In today's world, this is even exciting in, in the concept of, say, timing of vaccine administration or understanding our body's immune response through the day. And so we hope that understanding our body's biological clock and the way our, our liver really reacts to, to drugs especially can, can play into this idea of personalized medicine and really impact the future of patient care and therapeutics. So we hope that we can use the right drug at the right dosage at the right time for the right person. So Sandra and Nikita uh, and their colleague Liliana are in Professor Sengi Dabatia's laboratory for multi-scale regenerative technologies. Um, myself, uh, Stuart Levine and Dikshant Pradhan um, are in the Ostrom Bioinformatics Corps, which is part of the Swanson Biotechnology Center. And um, we're all grateful to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the National Cancer Institute for our funding. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Charlie, Nikita, and Sandra. Um, so next we're gonna hear from Team Microscopy. Uh, thank you, Jackie. I'm Omar Yomaz. Uh, I'm an associate professor of biology and I'm also a pathologist at NGH. My lab is interested in diet and cancer and we specialize in the development of many organs known as organoid bodies that we can use to model normal and disease states in a, in a culture dish. This particular project is a partnership between my lab and the Microscopy Core facility to support our organoid research. To kick things off, I'd like to introduce George Eng, a physician scientist and postdoctoral research in my lab. George. Hi, uh, my name is George Eng. I'm a postdoc in the Yilmaz lab. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you about a project that we have uh, looking at organoids um, and uh, the title of the talk or uh, slides are in the inner life of intestinal organoids and colon cancer. And this is a collaboration in the lab with one of the other postdocs, Jonathan Braverman. And then also we've been uh, collaborating with Jeffrey, um, the director of the microscopy core facility on trying to image and learn more about these organoids, which I'll explain uh, to you further in the coming slides. So um, as a pathologist, um, what we look at are histologic sections of tissues. And so this is a representative section of the colon, uh, which is an organ in our body. And the primary purpose of the, or of the colon is to resorb water from our digested food. Um, but it has this very interesting uh, arrangement uh, histologically where these uh, test tube-like structures called crypt uh, domains um, uh, are how the cells are organized in the tissue with the stem cells residing at the base of the crypt um, and they divide and differentiate until they get to the top of the crypt, which provides the um, resorptive capacity of the tissue. But as we all know, um, unfortunately, colon uh, tissues can give rise to cancer. And colon cancer is the second most common cause of cancer in the United States, um, and it's still an ongoing problem. Um, and to model this in the lab, um, we use different uh, genetic perturbations, which mimic the uh, progression of colon cancer um, in people. So the tumor suppressor gene APC or adenomatous polyposis coli gets mutated um, and that can cause a tumor. And so you can see here on the right side of the screen is where we've mutated that gene just like it happens in people uh, in the colon of a mouse. And it disrupts the normal regular architecture that you can see on the left uh, of the test tube like uh, crypt structures. And you get this overgrowth of uh, adenomatous and cancerous tissue, which creates this, uh, this tumor, uh, which, you know, is cancer. Next slide. Um, but one thing that's interesting about the colon that we uh, utilize is we can liberate the crypts from the underlying tissue 
and grow them in the lab in these mini tissues called organoids. Um, they're called organoids because they're like mini versions of organs um, because they exhibit cellular heterogeneity um, where their stem cells and differentiated cells, um, but they do so in a very complex three-dimensional environment. So what we do is we liberate the crypts, uh, which I described earlier, um, and embed them into a hydrogel, which is a jello-like substance, uh, which is a three-dimensional matrix you could see there. Um, and once we embed them, uh, the gel sets just like regular jello. Um, and then we provide additional growth factors and media on top of them so that they, we can sustain them outside of the body, either from people or from mice. And this is a representative uh, images of what those organoids look like for normal organoids, where they're from normal healthy tissues on the left and tumors on the right. And so you could see the normal tissues have very spherical round um, uh, sort of bubbly kind of character. And the tumor um, organoids have, uh, though st still spherical, um, have sort of a more misshapen, uh, denser kind of uh, quality to their growth. Uh, and what's interesting is we're able to modify these uh, organoids outside the body um, to make them fluorescent. And that allows us to grow them together in competition assays. So we can try to see what makes the tumor grow well or the normal grow well, because we want to identify conditions where we can grow normal at the expense of growing tumor. And so here is an example of one of those uh, such experiments. So the normal tissues or uh, the, the organoids that were derived from normal tissues are green and the tumor organoids are uh, in red. So you can see on the left, this growth condition, uh, the media condition that we grew them in, uh, selects for growth of the tumor, which is actually the basal kind of uh, growth condition where the tumor grows quite well, but the normal um, doesn't grow very well at all. There's a little green dots. Um, however, in this other condition that we uh, generated in the lab, condition B, the normal tissues in green grow quite robustly, but we're actually able to inhibit the growth of the tumor cells, which is something we're all very interested in uh, in terms of trying to identify conditions which uh, inhibit tumor, but uh, improve the actual growth of the normal tissues. And so uh, I've been working with Jeffrey in the microscopy uh, core facility to try to understand what is the what are the potential mechanisms that actually underlie these growth conditions which select for uh, tumor inhibition, but normal cell growth. And so this is a 3D confocal microscopy of the tumor organoids where uh, the where cell nuclei are labeled in purple, but actually uh, cell death is actually labeled in green. And we actually think there's this process where the organoids um, in some of the growth conditions that you just saw, they actually cause cell death where the organoids spit out the cells uh, and they read out uh, this death marker um, and that they actually remove them uh, into the intracellular, intraluminal uh, centers of the organoids. Um, and we're interested in studying this process over time um, and this is something where we really need Jeff's um, technical expertise uh, for long-term longitudinal imaging of such a complex three-dimensional structure um, to follow this biological process. Hi, so I'm Jeffrey Kuhn. I'm the core, Microscopy Core Facility Director at uh, the Koch Institute. So I'm, uh, I got my undergraduate in electrical engineering and a PhD in biology from the University of Texas. I have been in uh, doing biochemistry at Yale. I've had my own lab doing biochemistry for a while and now I run the microscopy facility. So um, this kind of uh, 3D confocal microscopy that you're seeing here is an exquisite picture of, of what these, um, organoids look like, but it's really just a snapshot. And to take these kind of confocal microscope images, you uh, basically illuminate a specimen. You're taking one single plane in red, but you're just, you're illuminating the entire specimen when you're taking it. Um, and what that does is it damages or it destroys the flora for you're, you're trying to look at. So confocal imaging is great. It's great. It's great 3D images like you saw, but it's very slow. It can take 10 to 30 minutes per volume, and it's very harsh, and it destroys the fluorescence you want to look at. So another type of, of microscopy is called light sheet microscopy. Here you sort of illuminate from the side a very thin layer, and then you just look at only what's being illuminated at a single time point. 
Um, and so this kind of light sheet microscopy is much gentler, preserves the fluorescence very well. Um, and it's fairly fast, it's faster than the, than the confocal, maybe one to five minutes per volume. But your specimen has to be surrounded by a whole bunch of different objectives. There's not a lot of room for a whole bunch of different organoids if you're trying to screen various conditions. So there's a new type of microscope out there. It's called oblique plane light sheet microscope. And here you look at the, the specimen or the organoids, or in this case, a zebrafish from the bottom with a, a tilted light sheet. And you sort of look sideways at this, this image or at this plane that's being illuminated. And this method, because you, it's very few moving parts, it's like a race car. It can take one to four seconds per volume compared to 10 to 30 minutes per volume with confocal. And just like the, the light sheet in the middle, it's very gentle and it preserves all the fluorescence. But the problem is there's no commercial option available. You can't buy one of these things. You have to build it. So that's what uh, I've been working on for a while. Um, and that is to basically build one of these single objective light sheets where you can place a bunch of organoids in multi-well uh, plates and under various drug and screening conditions um, and look at them and scan these, these organoids over time repeatedly under various conditions in multiple uh, time points and multiple fluorophores. So the idea is that you basically make a slice um, at an angle or a biased slice through that organoid. And this is just an example of that light sheet scanning back and forth. Um, and this is slowed down so you can see it actually going back and forth. But the idea then is that you gather all those slices and hopefully you can do that within just a few seconds and then 3D project those, those slices that you've looked at and generate these kind of 3D uh, pictures of organoids, but are much, much faster and much gentler than um, the method George showed you earlier. But just to give you an idea of what you actually need to do to look sideways. So this is the current state of the optics it takes to look sideways. So there's a lot of engineering and uh, involved in making one of these types of systems. And uh, I'm really grateful that the Koch Institute's um, and the uh, stem cell initiative has let me build this pilot project. So we're still working on this, but hopefully what we're going to get to is something like this. And this is um, taken from a, a, the Anna Rios's lab in the Netherlands at the Hubrecht Institute, showing you what, what kind of, what you can see with light sheets looking at organoids. So the idea is that you can look at organoids in great detail with light sheet in a very gentle manner, um, and what I want to be able to do is follow George's organoids over time in these multiple wells. Um, so I'll let George finish up with the acknowledgments. Oh, yeah. So, um, of course, I want to thank Omer, uh, the lab whose uh, this work was uh, sort of derived, um, Dayao Zhang and Camille Huang, who are the undergrads in the lab. Uh, the rest of the lab, um, the JAX lab, and of course, the Swanson Biotechnology Center um, for their help. Um, the, yeah, I think Jeff also wants to um, mention the MIT Stem Cell Initiative Pilot Award, and of course, all the cores and some of the other funding sources. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Omer, George, uh, and Jeffrey. Um, we're now going to go um, to team uh, High Throughput Sciences. So if you, you all would like to take it away. I mute myself and share my screen. All right, thanks, Jackie. Um, we want to present a project today that is about lysosome targeting chimeras. And the lysosome is basically a cellular recycling facility. It takes care of all non-functional proteins, uh, DNA, RNA complexes, breaks them down and gives the cell the building blocks to produce new um, functional proteins. It's a very conceptual approach and we are looking to hijack um, these uptake mechanisms to the recycling center for cancer therapy. So the researchers and partners in crime on this project are myself, uh, postdoc um, trained in chemical biology from the Curler lab, Natalie on the right side, um, a chemical engineer from uh, Paula Hammond's lab, and of course our heroes from the high throughput sciences core, Christian and Jamie. 
The idea of this project is that there are challenging or undruggable cancer drivers or cancer targets where we have no drug yet to, to tackle them. Um, but there may be binders out there that bind to the cancer driver, but do not inactivate them. Therefore, there cannot be drugs. There's also this cellular recycling center called lysosome, which destroys proteins or also cancer drivers. The question is only how can we bring the cancer driver to the cellular recycling center to tell the cancer cell basically break down this cancer driver um, and ultimately the cell, the cancer cell will die. We know that these recycling acceptors have specific binding signatures or binding motives that they bind to and thereby recruit the non-functional proteins of DNA or RNA. We also know that we have certain binders that bind to certain cancer drivers but cannot be drugs because they only bind and not inactivate. So the idea is to generate a lysosome targeting chimera, which has the binder on the one side that binds the cancer driver and another binder on the other side that binds the recycling acceptor, thereby recruits the cancer driver to the cellular recycling center. It is internalized and degraded in the recycling center. So we know that there's an interaction between these binding signatures and recycling acceptors. Um, and what we wanna do is we wanna replace this binding signature by a, a small molecule here shown as the red bubble um, because small molecules um, are better drugs than physiological binding signatures. And how would we do that? And that's where Chris and Jamie step in um, in the high throughput sciences core because we basically have to find the needle in the haystack uh, because we don't really know what kind of compound we are looking for because it is, it is not known at this point. And I'll hand over to Kristen and Jamie and they will tell you how we do that. Hi, my name is Jamie Chia. I am the scientific director of the High Throughput Sciences Facility at the Swanson Biotechnology Center. Um, I got my PhD from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and Neuroscience, did a postdoctoral fellowship at Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research and was a research scientist at the Broad Institute where I led a team of biologists doing cancer cell line profiling before joining the KI seven years ago to run the HTS. So the HTS is a microcosm of the KI, biologists and engineers working together. And our job is to help trainees wrangle these large scale experiments. Screening is about finding a magic pinch of fairy dust, but you have to sift through a lot of dust because as Andre said, you don't know what you're looking for. And our job is to help scientists do this where these experiments can't be done on a lab uh, lab bench top one petri dish at a time. So luckily for us, the HTS is equipped with robotics and automation that Jackie mentioned has typically seen in pharmaceutical companies. And using our liquid handlers and echo acoustic transfer machine, we reduced these 65,000 compounds that Andre was interested in screening to into 384 well plates. And we ran them in duplicate. And in the end, we had 414 of these 384 well plates where each well is a unique experiment. So you can envision that each well is like one Petri dish. With all the controls and everything built in, we ended up generating 160,000 unique data points. And I'm gonna hand this off to Christian now to explain a little bit about the machine that was used. Hi everyone, my name is Christian Soule and I'm the automation director in the High Throughput Sciences Corps at the Koch Institute. I graduated from Boston University with a degree in mechanical engineering. And prior to joining the HTS, I built many automated systems for pharma companies around the world. We utilized the ECHO to transfer our library of compounds into experimental plates for Andre and Natalie to then screen. And you can see this video demonstrating how this instrument works. The ECHO is a unique instrument in that it uses sound to transfer liquids. This is a source plate being loaded, followed by a destination plate, which you'll see in a moment. As you can see from this video, the ECHO uses a single pulse, which you will see, uh, to analyze plate thickness and fluid thickness for each of the 384 wells. Then it adjusts the energy required on the fly to eject a droplet, which levitates into the destination plate and it adheres uh, based on surface tension. Uh, and it will actually stick to the bottom of the destination plate well. Uh, so you can see here the pulse, it works uh, exactly like sonar. Uh, for perspective, the transfers are in the nanoliter range, which is one billionth of a liter. Uh, the instrument can transfer all 384 wells in under three minutes without the need for washing or consumables. And this allows our community to run these large scale experiments with much less material. 
Uh, now that we've talked to you about how we've enabled the screen, um, I'd like to hand it back to Andre for him to tell you how he interpreted over 160,000 data points. Uh, all right, Christian Jing, um, thanks for showing us how you actually bring the compounds that we're interested in into plates so we can actually screen them. Um, when we get the plates back from um, Christian and Jamie, and those are 65,000 compounds um, in duplicates. So we, we're talking about a lot, a lot of data points. And we have to miniaturize this, um, and which we cannot do in our lab because we have bigger petri dishes, bigger volumes. And we don't want to do that over and over 65,000 times in these big volumes. And that's when we use the high throughput sciences core. When we get the plates back and have them screened, they very much look like this. We have controls on the top and in the bottom of the plate, which basically tell us if the assay that we did, the experiment that we did, um, is within parameters. So it is basically working. Then we have these yellow dots here, which are basically negative results. These compounds do not bind to the recycling acceptor. But then every now and then we see these red spots lighting up, wells where we actually have compounds that do something in our assay system. And we are usually really, really excited about these compounds when they show up in those plates. But because we don't wanna do that 400, 500 times with every plate, we usually put all these dots into a graph, um, put the replicates on one axis, um, a second replicate on the other axis, set a certain cutoff and all these red dots here in the top right corner those are our candidate binders, which we can use for further um, light tech design to bring cancer drivers into the lysosome where they are destroyed and where then the cancer cell finally is destroyed as well. So it's not destroyed in the compartment, but as a result, the cancer cell will be destroyed. But what is the, the fanciest and newest technology worth or the best compound worth if it's not going where it's needed? And that is a problem um, with a lot of cancer drugs. They're just not going where they are needed. And to bring them where they needed, um, we need an engineer, right? Like Natalie, um, to come up with ways how to deliver these compounds to cancer cells and to subcellular lo localizations where they're actually needed. And I'll hand it over to Natalie from here. Thanks, Andre. Um, so to echo what he was saying, um, delivery challenges are a huge uh, barrier to translation, particularly in the in the cancer space, um, because we have to think about not only being able to target the um, therapeutic compound of interest to the target disease site, but we also have to make sure to protect the cargo um, during the delivery and then make sure that after it gets to the site of the tumor that it gets into the, the cell of interest as well. And so in the Hammond lab, we um, like to use uh, nanoparticles and a special type of nanoparticle called a layer by layer nanoparticle that allows us to uh, deliver all sorts of um, anti-cancer therapies to um, the target disease site. And I'll get into the specifics of how we engineer these layer by layer nanoparticles um, in a little bit, but um, what we can do is use the outer layer um, of the nanoparticle to target specific receptors at the site of the tumor where they're overexpressed so that we can make sure that the cargo gets only to the tumor site as opposed to other places where we don't want it to go. And so in, in this context, um, we wanted to formulate some of the LITAC um, peptide candidates. Um, and so here we layered, um, or excuse me, we loaded the um, peptides into our, our liposomal core, which is um, what we can use to package these peptides um, that allows us to protect um, the, the cargo from degradation. Um, and then we can um, follow up with our layer by layer um, films on the next slide. And these allow us to um, specifically formulate our nanoparticles to target specific cancer uh, types and cell subpopulations. Um, and um, we were able to put not only the light tag candidate into our layer by layer nanoparticle, but we also included a fluorescent tag so that we can track it um, for our follow up studies, which are shown on the next slide. So after formulating the LITAC peptide candidate into our layer by layer nanoparticles, we were able to evaluate peptide delivery actually with help from another core in flow cytometry. And we incubated just the peptide on its own with cancer cells um, where we saw almost no delivery to the cells. 
Um, and in contrast, when we formulated this LIHTAC peptide with our nanoparticle and incubated that with the cells, we saw almost 100% um, delivery to the cancer cells, um, which is a great demonstration of how we are able to use our engineering capabilities to improve the delivery of therapeutics. And now what we're working on is tailoring our nanoparticle formulations to be able to direct the peptide exactly where it needs to go inside the cell. And so layer by layer assembly is quite modular and it allows us to switch out the outer layers to specifically target and direct the nanoparticles and the cargo to the desired cell compartment. And this is done um, actually also with help from the microscopy core where we can study uptake of nanoparticles by cancer cells. And what we're showing here is the accumulation of two different types of layer by layer nanoparticles with different outer layers there and they both accumulate um, inside the cancer cells but in different subcellular compartments and so further studies are going to focus on mixing and matching the nanoparticle properties with the LITAC cargo for optimized targeted delivery and therapeutic efficacy and now I'll hand things over back to Andre to finish up our presentation. Thank you Natalie. Um, and with, with this we basically want to finish our presentation and we hope we could demonstrate that we go new avenues and pathways in cancer research and how we find the pinch of magic dust with the help of the high throughput sciences core and of course we want to thank our, our group leaders um, for giving us an opportunity to do this highly creative um, research in this um, highly stimulating environment and of course our heroes Christian and Jamie um, which support us a lot um, as do all the other cores of the Swanson Biotechnology Center at the Koch Institute. I hand it back to Jackie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian and Jamie and uh, Andre and, and I think Natalia um, and, and everybody else. I, no one else can uh, applaud, so I'm going to applaud for everybody. Um, we're now going to turn it open to um, a panel um, discussion. So if everybody could turn their cameras on, um, we'll, we'll pull everybody into the conversation. And for those of you who are watching, please feel free to write questions in your question and answer section, and I will read them out. Um, and while you're typing, I'm going to sort of open up uh, for discussion. So first off, I want to introduce uh, Sarah Farrington, um, or Dr. I should say Dr. Sarah Farrington, who's the SBC Core Facility Administrator um, and who I work with very closely and really oversees um, this full ship. So I'd like to start off with Sarah by asking her if you could tell us a little bit about your background, um, your role and your motivation um, for doing this. Hi, Jackie, thank you for that introduction and kudos to all of you for your presentations. Those were really beautiful. Um, a little bit about me. I started at the Koch Institute. Actually, it was the Center for Cancer Research at the time um, back in 1997. It was shortly after I finished my doctoral studies in developmental genetics at Harvard. I came to work with Nancy Hopkins, who's now Professor Emerita, and I, my, uh, my role was to help her run a very large, highly collaborative project identifying genes that direct vertebrate development. Not surprisingly, it turned out that some of the genes we uncovered also played a role in cancer, um, which led to a collaboration with Jackie. Now, as associate director, Jackie had responsibilities for directing the Koch Institute core facilities. And in 2006, she asked me um, to help her with that effort. So I thought at the time, well, this seemed like a great opportunity to put my extensive scientific training to good use. But in retrospect, it's really been so much more than that. I'm, I feel incredibly fortunate to work with the people on this panel and many others to um, improve, to expand, and to build this critical research infrastructure, um, the SBC. And this infrastructure enables our community members, all of our community members, at every step in their research. My role um, is to manage the administration and operations across all cores. It means it entails maintaining institutional memory while also anticipating and fostering future initiatives. Overall, my role allows our, our core leaders to focus their efforts on science, um, the science that you've heard about today. Um, they support researchers through training and consultation. They maintain and further their own expertise and that of their staff. They develop cross-core collaborations and they pursue their visions for their course. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. We really couldn't do this without you. Um, so now I wanna um, maybe sort of uh, throw things open a little and, and I'd like to start um, by asking people, um, the researchers themselves, and I'm, I'm gonna sort of call on Sandra and Nikita and hope you don't feel outed, um, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, how working with your SPC partners really 
uh, brought things in research that you didn't expect? Yeah, I'd love to answer that. So okay. we work with Charlie. Um, and so our work again is, is circadian rhythm. And as Charlie already detailed, there is a large amount of data that comes from the work we do. As you said, it's like one TB of data. And from all this data, we really need to whittle it down and find these patterns. And, and Charlie makes it sound so incredibly easy, but it's not. It's really complex. You know, you need to make sure there's no noise in what we're looking at. You need to make sure that everything is going the way it is, that maybe you need to push the analysis one way or another based on how we wanna see these patterns. And I, I cannot tell you how much we have asked Charlie to be like, 24 hours, what about 27 or less or half or, and he is so incredibly talented and in, incredible at what he does that he picks it up immediately. Something that would take us years to do, Charlie does immediately. And so together we're able to bounce off one another, both in the biology and, and the, the pattern and the programming. Part yeah. of it. Yeah, because this was like a new area for us. We were like a new project. And as a biologist, we just were not like looking genes, go, genes going up and down. We were like looking at patterns. And this is so difficult. So when he, Charlie helped us with the algorithms just to identify the patterns. So it was extremely important for, for the project. This is a recurring theme for all of us who work with the cause. You know, you know, we had naive ideas about where we wanted to get to and but couldn't have even conceived of how to navigate that path and um, the experts have really made that um, uh, possible for us. So, so I want to sort of open this up maybe to, to anybody, but, but um, uh, I, I'm sort of curious about, you know, I think almost all of you have, have worked at some point in your life in other institutions or other academic, clinical, or industrial settings, and you've used core facilities there. So, you know, I'd like you to tell me what's what's different about the SPC that's enabled your work. Yeah, I can, I can start. I can start this off. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think many of the technologies um, are as good, um, if not better, than what we see, for example, at the hospitals. And what really, I think, what makes it unique is the staff interactions here make a huge difference. It's really important and value, valuable to me as a lab head and teacher for my trainees to have access and support of the facilities at the Coke. Uh, the, you know, as you've seen and heard, you know, everyone is really responsive to our specific needs. Um, you know, Jeffrey's in the microscopy core is really uh, going out of his way to ensure that we have the best technologies to really support our research. Thank you, Amen. Maybe somebody from the, from the core facility staff side of things. I'd like to chime in um, the the equipment just in my background of, of building these automated systems. These are found in pharma companies, what we have in our lab, these robotic platforms where we have a centralized scheduling software that controls all different types of specialized equipment with a robot moving samples from one instrument to another. Effectively, it's a third staff member for Jamie and I. Um, it allows us to run 24 seven unsupervised. Um, and the, the capabilities of the instrumentation itself are just absolutely state of the art. Uh, so we're very lucky to have this investment from, from MIT and from the Koch Institute specifically. Thank you, Christian. We have a couple of questions in the chat. So the first one's from Christopher Jones, and it says, thank you for all your great presentations, all great research. In the bioinformatics, do you use GPUs to accelerate your work? So I'm looking at you, Charlie. Yeah, I'm uh, just clicking on mute. Um, we don't have GPUs in our cluster right now uh, because our workflow, um, the sequence-based workflow that we, we deal with is uh, more uh, memory uh, limited than it is processor speed limited. So um, we are, are, are the workflows, the bioinformatics sequencing based workflows that we do don't really need GPU at the moment, but um, um, we're constantly being asked about it and, and looking in and priced out uh, nodes that have the GPU. So I imagine it will be uh, pretty soon that we'll buy some of that stuff. Um, if we got to a place where we needed it right away, we would always have the option to uh, use um, Amazon cloud services to get that going. So. Thank you, Charlie. And there's another question in the chat and I'm, I'm looking at you, Sarah, because I think it's in your wheelhouse. Um, it's from an anonymous, anonymous attendee. Wow, the SPC truly is the heartbeat of the Coke. Is the SPC funded by the government? If so, what role does philanthropy, sorry, 
philant I can't say this word. <laughs> philanthropy. <laughs> philanthropy, thank you. Um, play. And what, what have you done through donations that cannot be done through government funding alone? Well, I'll answer the government funding piece. We've had continuous funding from the National Cancer Institute for, um, for the Cancer Center. Um, I think we're in our 42nd year of continuous funding. Um, Jackie and I play a big role in writing that grant every five years, uh, as do all of the core folks who feed us all kinds of information to write about. So we've been, I've been through three of those um, renewals. Jackie's been through, as associate director, been through four. Um, and they support, uh, they allow us to really stabilize the core um, staffing from a staffing perspective. Um, philanthropy, uh, well, <laughs> Jackie, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I, I, I you know, the, the, the uh, Cancer Center core grant is really critical to our operation and it contributes to salaries, but, but it doesn't get us all the way there. In fact, it hasn't gone up um, even in, in real dollars without inflation um, in the 20 years that I've been overseeing this. So we're absolutely dependent on funds from other sources. Um, both to help us with the salary um, support and in particular to buy the cutting edge equipment um, we need. We do not use any government money to do that. Philanthropy played a tremendous role in the equipment for the nano nanotechnology materials for building that um, that cryo EM imaging, really state of the art, um, very few in the world imaging facilities was, was based on philanthropies. And the uh, micro C take uh, capabilities that we have in the animal imaging core and um, you know, a lot of outside resources for bioinformatics and sequencing um, capabilities. You know, I, I think probably a good 50% or, or more of our equipment um, funds come from those types of sources. So it's really critical to ensure the operation. Um, okay, I'm gonna throw out um, one more question. We're actually almost at the end, so I'm just gonna throw out one sort of future question. Um, and, you know, um, so, so this, is year, this year is our 10th anniversary. Um, of, the, of the Koch Institute in its new location. And um, obviously we consistently look forward and we're thinking about the future of a community. So I would like to ask uh, some of you to comment on, on what you view as the future of the SPC um, and what's coming down the pike. And I, I'm gonna ask Sarah again, and then maybe uh, throw it open to some of the other core uh, facility folks to comment too. Sure, so I would emphasize um, two points. One is big data, which we heard about from Charlie, and the other is cross-core collaboration. So in terms of big data, you know, it's not just genomic data, but we're, we're really experiencing, and we've been experiencing a, a deluge of, of big data resulting from sustained technological advances in, in data acquisition across numerous disciplines. So genomic, genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, proteomic, and small molecule analysis, flow cytometry, imaging, all of these are generating huge data sets, which are highly enabling. They allow researchers to probe deeply the changes that occur during tumor development, progression, and treatment, but also identify new approaches to studying aspects of, for example, cell signaling, alterations involved in development and response, development of and response to cancer immunotherapies, and more. So, you know, they're really important that we get as much out of them as we can. They also offer tremendous op opportunity, these enormous data sets, to build machine learning al algorithms that can learn numerous tasks, such as identifying patterns, making predictions from existing data, and then applying those tasks um, to new data. So such tools can be used, for example, to enable efficient interpretation of new data or predict new materials and compounds um, with improved quality. So, our cores have a number of great ideas for machine learning approaches, and I'll give you one example. It's an initiative conceived by Virginia Spanadaki, who's the director of the Preclinical Imaging and Testing Facility, and she's working in collaboration with MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Her idea is to use preclinical imaging data sets to create automated tools that will help KI researchers improve the design of their preclinical studies. And the end goal is really to facilitate screening of therapeutics and devices in order to improve selection 
for entry into clinical trials and really to improve the success during clinical trials since so many things fail in the first round. Um, she also importantly uh, plans to incorporate data generated in other SBC cores and thereby um, plans to leverage and increase the collective impact of the SBC. So as far as big data goes in the future, we really expect to fully realize the potential of these data sets and to implement um, a series of ma machine learning initiatives. And to do this, it's essential we expand our data scientist team and hire individuals specifically with machine learning skills. Um, I talked about cross-core um, collaborative, um, cross-core collaborations. We have a number of um, uh, platforms that we want to develop that will require uh, expertise from many different people. You've heard projects today that say they drew on lots of different cores. Here we're talking about the core expertise and the need for cores to collaborate together to make something work. Um, and the Koch Institute is really known for its collaborative organizational model, and that extends to us in the SBC. So, for example, Charlie and Jeffrey have um, organized in, uh, already in collaboration with Stuart Levine and Kathy Cormier in the Histology Core. They've organized an analysis platform that leverages expertise from histology to produce sections, tissue sections, from microscopy to image those sections, from genomics to sequence um, while maintaining spatial context, and informatics, making sense of the data. And these, um, this kind of approach really complements and expands existing genomic techniques by adding valuable spatial context to understand exactly how tissue and tumor microenvironments are arranged relative to gene expression at the level of the individual cell. So I think in the future, we expect to see a lot more of these kind of cross-core collaborations. Um, and I think that the SPC, the way that it's set up is poised to be able to do that um, very effectively. Thank you, Sarah. I think since we're already five minutes over the hour, uh, I think we should sort of end the questions. Um, I, I just want to note there was a question in the in the chat about how to get in touch with the SPC and work more. Um, you can find information about it on our website. So go to the KI website and each of the calls are listed. And please feel free to email any of the call leaders. Um, they're very happy to take questions um, and answer anything you have. Um, with that note, um, I'd really like to end um, firstly by highlighting and applauding all of the um, folks on the call today. You've done amazing science and that was really underpinned by the um, core facility staff and I cannot thank you enough um, for making uh, this job a pleasure um, to oversee all these calls. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I also want to end again um, by uh, thanking the friends and family um, and Sigma Chi brothers um, of Bob Swanson. You have really been critical um, in this effort from the very beginning with us. You helped establish the SPC cause, you've really made it the amazing place it is and you've continued um, to support and cheerlead us. So again, I want to make a very personal um, thanks to you for all of your effort um, and how much we appreciate it. And with that, um, I'm going to thank everybody in the audience for their um, participation and attention. It was really um, a pleasure to talk to you all. And I hope next time we'll get to do this in person and not over Zoom. Um, so please have a lovely evening.